that they have a real uh, they have a real vested interest and uh, that they care about the company deeply. And 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 you know when when the vast majority stick around for almost six hours, uh, you, you know they really do care. And and uh, anyway, let's let's jump into it and and we'll roll through again. Uh, the presentation. And again, some slides we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on. Uh, the only thing I would say here, you know, we have a mission statement, of course, uh, and, and it really is to provide inspired residences for adventurous souls. Again, that being the theme that, that links all of us together, that spirit of adventure. Uh, the one major unique selling proposition, the differentiator in the marketplace that we have, is that we actually have properties and communities today in four countries, ultimately six, seven, eight countries of the region. And what it lets us do is that it allows us to listen to what a customer wants and serve them with that product. Uh, fundamentally, this is a huge differentiator in the marketplace. We're going to talk more about how that is and why. Again, you're on this presentation because you, uh, you may want to own shares of our company. We've been around a long time. We're in our 25th year of business. It's very diversified. Again, four countries. Uh, many projects. Uh, we are hoping to take the company public. We're planning, not just hoping, we're planning to take the company public. We're doing the kinds of things that we have to do to get there. Obviously, it's a future event. We can't predict the future, but we can do the things that are in our control to make it as highly uh, probable and possible uh, as we can, and we are. Uh, and then if you have uh, an IRA, self-directed IRA, you can own the stock inside an IRA. I would also mention that we've had several folks come through recently who invested with crypto. We accept crypto as a means of investing to own shares. Uh, the same thing with metals. We, we've taken metals uh, as well as a way to own property and or invest in the company. Uh, as you can see, we've been around again. This is our 25th year of business. We started in 1996. We've had nice, steady, conservative growth. Uh, here we are today, kind of over about the three-quarter of the way, current share price, $17.60, uh, and we expect it to double uh, by the time we plan to take the company public 2024, 2025. So uh, you're getting in at a great time. It's, 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 it's the last big push for the expansion of the company to get us where we need to go. Uh, we're going to talk about lots of, I call it steak and potatoes. Uh, you know, the meat and potatoes of the company are huge assets. Uh, a Marriott property that we're developing right now in Belize is the sizzle. Uh, again, it, it's not just sizzle, but, you know, we're, we're the valuation of the company and the, we have, you know, uh, 4,000 acres and five miles of beachfront property. There's a lot of physical, very valuable assets uh, that the company has, but but this particular asset will be huge sizzle for the company. Uh, 2020 was a great year. We're going to look at some numbers in a second, but 2020 was also a great year in our expansion. Uh, we ended up uh, acquiring a property in the highlands of Panama, a couple of top pictures there, beautiful uh, community in the mountains near Boquete. It's springtime all the time. It's a very different geography than what uh, most people think of when they think of the tropics, but it's a, it's a popular geography. Uh, we introduced our tiny homes. Uh, the, these are the tiny homes in Grand Pacifica. We introduced tiny homes in Belize over the water. Uh, and uh, we, we pre-sold an entire building in, in Belize in our Best Western, which is the fleet building. Uh, great sales year. We're, again, we're going to look at some more specific numbers in a moment. Uh, generally, take a look at this. You know, sales, gross sales in 2019, three and a half million. 2020, nine and a half million. We almost tripled uh, our, our business in one year from 19 to 20. But even more impressive, if you look at the numbers from the beginning of 21 through April 30th, the first four months of 2021, we have already eclipsed what we did in all of 20. Uh, that things, are, things are moving well. There are a lot of reasons things have moved well. We'll get into some of those. Uh, the bottom line is that we've built an institution. We, we, we've, we've gone from being this entrepreneurial company to, an, to, to really a corporate entity with institutionalized knowledge, with systems, processes, procedures that allow us to turn on a dime. And, and we're going to talk about how we turned on that dime and, and why that's important. Uh, the idea of being in many geographies through the region uh, a country at the bottom of this curve, the I call it the popularity curve, right? Uh, how popular is Nicaragua? Not very popular. Not very many people from Des Moines, Iowa taking their honeymoons there, right? A Pacific side of Costa Rica, very popular, right? You've got uh, JW Marriott's and Four Seasons Hotels. It's, it's the pinnacle of, of popularity in the tourism market. And the other places, you know, kind of somewhere on that, on that chart in between. You know what? 
we're going to look at the different assets that we own based on this chart. Remember this chart, the popularity chart, and, and, and you'll see why the assets we own are along this spectrum uh, and, and in very strategic ways. That, that's the important takeaway. They're strategic placements on this development curve. So if you decide you want to own shares, you're going to own shares in the holding company. Please remember that. It's everything we do. It's all of our properties, but it's also all of our service businesses, utilities, property and rental management. All of these things are part of what you will own as a shareholder of our company. We deliver community. We, building, we build community. We deliver community. It's the foundation of quality of life, and it's critically important. And it doesn't happen by accident. It happens through science and art. Uh, we, we, we've hired uh, some of the world's uh, best urban planners who know how to create community from the ground up, create something organic. Uh, and, and again, it's a science and an art, and we've implemented it successfully. Community is happening. And Grand Pacific is a great example of that. 11, now almost 12 years ago, this was a cattle pasture. And today, it's the village by the sea. Um, and it's a community. Uh, and, and, and what that means to our owners, because again, we always have to focus on the consumer. This presentation is about you investing in our company, but the reason we're successful is we serve consumers so well, right? I mean, that, that's foundationally the bottom line and, and community is the hallmark of quality of life. Uh, I always like to point out, I think most of you know, I, uh, my wife, Carol, my daughter, Amanda, myself, this picture was taken in 2002. We moved to Nicaragua for what we thought would just be a few years, maybe two, three years, get our Grand Pacifica community started. Uh, you know, we, we, we loved it so much. We had another little daughter, Emily, came along uh, because it's a great place to be. It's a great place to have fun. It's a great place to raise a family, Girl Scouts, dance, great schools, Nicaragua. Think about that, right? But we ended up staying a total of, of uh, 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 16 years. We, I mean, we, we loved it. We loved Nicaragua. And, um, uh, and, and, and the important takeaway on this is I have lived the expat experience. You know, we, we, we went there for two or three years. I said we lived there 16 years, but we actually lived there 14 years. We came back in 2016. Um, but, but the point is, is that the, the experience has let me understand what it means to be an expat. Not just to sell it, not just to write about it, and you know, not just to think about it, but to actually have that experiential knowledge and then be able to translate that into the products and services we offer our consumers. It's powerful, um, and, uh, and 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 I get it, and many of you do too. I think we have a lot of uh, expats on this uh, on this call this evening. Uh, you know, waves of change are waves of opportunity. Um, you know, it, it happened in the development business uh, in the 1960s and early 1970s. Dell Webb. Who, in, who was the creator of Sun City, uh, a brilliant man, came up with really three foundational strokes of genius. One, he understood demographics, he figured there were going to be a whole bunch of people wanting to get out of the cold weather when they retired. He was right. So he went outside Phoenix, Arizona, he bought a giant piece of property, and he was the first person to really understand how to deliver community. Because when people leave their jobs, they're retiring, right? They leave their churches, they leave their clubs, their rotary club, whatever, their, their golf buddies, they leave all that and they move to a new place. They want to make new friends. They want to build new community. Dell Webb understood that and was the first developer to truly deliver that in his product. But the third stroke of genius was to me the best. He understood very quickly that not everybody would want to live in the desert of Arizona. So he built communities all over the United States, Florida, Texas, California, the Piedmonts, the Carolinas. And the marketplace rewards well-executed genius. Pulte bought Dell Webb for $1.8 billion. Right? So again, well-executed genius. Well, when you go south of the border, there's only one company doing what Dell Webb did. It's us, right? That's what we're doing. We've taken this model. We've gone south of the border. We're, we're, we're understanding the demographics. It's a new generation. It's baby boomers. And we'll talk about another generation too. Uh, but it's the baby boomers primarily for the last 25 years that we've been serving, right? Uh, people want community. We've figured out how to deliver that. But we also understood the same as Del Webb did. Not everybody wants to live in Belize or Costa Rica or Panama. Some people want the mountains. Some people want a vineyard community. Some people like the Caribbean. Some people like the Pacific, right? Different strokes for different folks, and we are the only developer in the region doing it this way. Who do we serve? Well, th this market's pretty thick with competitors, right? 
people building beautiful, you know, oceanfront properties, waterfalls in the lobby, on and on and on. You know, we've decided to serve this market because it's a huge market. It's so much thicker, so many more people, and it is virtually untouched. Most people don't want to play here, right? If you want to impress your friends, buy a fancy Park Avenue restaurant. If you want to make a lot of money, buy a Chick-fil-A, right? We're the Chick-fil-A of the business. We understand it. Now, chances are, if you are thinking about owning shares of our company, you are an accredited investor. And guess what? You're over here in this top percentage. You can afford you know, expensive, beautiful homes and, 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 and product around the world. Maybe you want to own that, maybe you don't, right? But if your budget is $100,000, $150,000, $200,000, that is your budget, right? That's who we serve. So whether or not our product is right for you, understand that we're in the business of serving somebody with a budget of $100,000, $150,000, And this is the opportunity to serve those people, make money, and build a company, which is what we've done. Uh, we work with a bank that provides financing. If you're middle class, you probably need financing. And, and there are very few institutions that will lend money in the region to a foreigner. Uh, we, we've partnered with one. Uh, the boomer statistics, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Again, uh, it, it, demographics play a big role. 93 million baby boomers, very wealthy. Uh, and they're retiring at a rate of 11500 a day for the next 16 years. So we've built this company. We've built this foundation. Either say we built the mousetrap. And we get to serve this same generation for the next decade and a half. Um, that, that's a long run with a machine that we've already built. Uh, you know, the, 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 the survey data is pretty strong. I mean, again, about one in 10 North Americans think they want to live overseas. Uh, and the data proves that out. Uh, the Canadian data is actually stronger. About half, 45% of Canadians plan to spend a month or more outside of Canada. So again, the demographics and the surveys really point to this need. And, and, and what's more important than surveys in my book is actually what people are doing right now. Uh, look at the numbers. Eight million North Americans are expats and 613 U.S. citizens have registered with a consulate or an embassy outside the United States. Again, the, the, these, are, these, are, these are elements of the business that are happening right now. But this one actually gets me the most excited. Uh, when we look at why our 2020 to 2021 numbers pivoted and ran hard. It was the introduction of products that served the Gen X, the Gen Y, and the millennials, the digital nomads, right? For the first time in human history, COVID did a lot of horrible things, right? But COVID did a couple things that are profound and have changed society forever. One of them was it decoupled the notion that work and the location of work had to be together. It decoupled that. For the first time ever, people, employees could work from home because they were told to, right? And not fear that they were going to get, you know, punished in some way, lose their job or not get promoted, right? And employers, what they found out was, holy smokes, if people don't have to commute and people, nah, nah, productivity actually has gone up for many companies. So not only, like, it, it, it's just a win-win. The employees don't have to deal with the traffic. They can stay home. The employers love it because they're more productive. Well, guess what? If your home is in Iowa or, or New York City or Chicago or San Francisco, your home can be in Belize, Costa Rica, Mexico. It does not matter anymore. There's a whole new group of people. And the biggest chunk of the new sales that have happened have come from this demographic. We as a company were ready. We had built a foundation. We had systems, processes, procedures. We actually know how to build the product that we sell. Many companies are great at selling. They can't deliver, right? This is the tragedy of real estate throughout the region. Buy Belize is a, is a horrible example. Uh, they, they sold hundreds of millions of dollars of real estate and delivered about $10 million of real estate, right? It was horrible, right? It's easy to sell. I hate to say that. It's not. Sorry, Rachel. It's not easy to sell. But, but it's a lot easier to sell a house than it is to build a house, right? And, and, and so uh, what we've done as an organization uh, is we figured out the processes, systems, procedures to be able to deliver the product that our sales team sells. That is a huge differentiator in the marketplace. It shouldn't be, right? Everybody should be able to deliver what they say they're going to deliver and what they sell. But the reality is very different in the marketplace. Um, and we can and we do. Quality of life, hey, you know what? We went for two or three years to Nicaragua. We stayed uh, a total of 14. Why? 
because it was a great quality of life. The medical care was wonderful. We had a great time. We enjoyed living there. We loved being expats. It's the reason people are coming to the region. And you know what? Again, we, we do as a company, we do a ton of corporate social responsibility. We, we probably spent 15 minutes on our, our shareholder meeting, maybe more, maybe 20 minutes on corporate social responsibility specifically. You know, th there are great reasons to do it, which are it's the right thing to do, but there are solid business reasons that it makes sense to do it too. Uh, anyway, we, we're not going to get into that too much. Again, coming back to the overview, if you own shares of ECI, you own shares of everything we do. Again, this, this popularity curve and, and the strategic ownership of assets along this curve, right? We bought a huge piece of property in Nicaragua for our Grand Pacifica community. It's three and a half miles of beachfront property, and it's a mile deep. Folks, that is a town. We are building a town at Grand Pacifica, and we hired an urban planner to help us do that, create a bunch of neighborhoods, uh, we built a golf course, homes, condominiums, restaurants, all that stuff, right? It's there. So again, this idea of a very inexpensive asset that as it grows in popularity, and Nicaragua is growing in popularity, um, in fact, the biggest part of our sales in the last 12 months came from Nicaragua. Again, if you're a baby boomer, you probably remember all the nonsense, you know, Ron Contra and Ollie North and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that all happened, you know, 30, 40 years ago, right? The baby boomers, the uh, uh, we remember that. The Gen Xers, the Gen Yers, the millennials, not even in their consciousness. Nicaragua is doing great. The popularity of the company, uh, country is going up. And because our company owns 2,500 acres of property and we developed about 5% of it, holy smokes, the other 95% is growing in value day in, day out. Again, serving a middle class, beautiful home, two bedroom, two bath. 1,200 square foot home, $140,000. Oceanfront condominium, $140,000. Three bedroom, two and a half bath house, two, 250. Again, serving that middle-class consumer with a wonderful high quality product that they can afford. Uh, uh, Rachel, I think a lot of our folks probably know the Teak and again, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but if you own ECI shares, you own the Teak plantations that we're developing at Grand Pacifica. Uh, again, it's a great asset class. Uh, we're, we're doing it because it's, it's, it's a wonderful product and, and we've got a lot of land. We've got 2,500 acres of land and, and, and growing teak on some of it makes a lot of sense. Uh, this is a picture of our nursery, some of our two, three-year-old teak there, probably two-year-old teak there. Um, but again, if you, if you like the agricultural element and you become a shareholder, just understand that you're going to have that piece in your portfolio as well. Uh, Co Caribbean side of Costa Rica. Notice Costa Rica is actually on here three times. Pacific Coast of Co Pacific Costa Rica is on the uh, top of the curve, you know, the Central Valley. Uh, but then the Caribbean side, kind of the, you know, the redheaded stepchild here. It hasn't been really popular. And, and, and we bought again, a very huge piece of property, 1,100 acres, 1 1.8 miles of coastline for a very, very inexpensive price back in 2006. Well, and, 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 and it was further back on the curve. So now it's coming up the curve. This asset has grown in value and we're parking it, we're land banking it because this property will be developed uh, with uh, a marina focus. It is an absolutely stunning piece of property for a marina community. Uh, and that's the target uh, deliverable for that particular piece of property. Uh, Panama, as you can see, is much higher up on the curve. It's popular, right? People know it. Every, you know, oh, Panama, yeah, you know, whatever. Many people actually lived there. They were stationed there in the military. So it's it's got name recognition in the marketplace. Well, okay, we've got two properties in Panama. We've got something at the beach on the Pacific, which is spectacular. And we just acquired this property in the Highlands. Um, the beach property is 750 acres. We're a 10% partner with Leif Simon and Kathy Petticord. We own a small stake in that business, but it lets us serve people who want Pacific Coast of Panama. We can serve them and, and help them with the product they want. Uh, the Highlands is very different. The Highlands is a beautiful piece of property. It came, we, we got the title registration in January of this year. Uh, it took about all of last year to get it acquired. Uh, we, we've, we've branded as a freedom village. Again, this idea of community. We have a large number of people who are looking for a place to call home 
uh, where they can enjoy the company of other, you know, freedom loving individuals and, and not have to worry about what they say or, 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 you know, the, the kinds of conversations they can find community. And again, look at the price point, a hundred thousand dollars, right? A hundred thousand dollars. Let somebody own a home in a springtime, all the time climate, uh, in a beautiful community. Uh, the, the, the road base is in the, 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 the underground infrastructure is largely in place. Uh, so this, project when we acquired it already had this infrastructure, which is tremendous because it lets us get to market about two years faster than if it was a greenfield site. Think about that. I mean, the time value of money, two years faster because the infrastructure is already there. The tiny homes were the product that really pushed us into the marketplace with that new generation, whether it was the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the digital nomads across all generations, actually. Tiny homes were great. We rolled them out in Belize, Nicaragua, Panama. Uh, uh, Belize, as you see, is in the sweet spot of the curve. The interesting thing about this is Belize is, is really transitioning right now from niche market, which is sort of below Belize, Argentina, Caribbean side of Costa Rica, Nicaragua, that's niche, right? to mainstream Pacific side of Costa Rica, Four Seasons Hotel, JW Marriott, right? Belize is cuspy. It's right on this transition. And to be able to understand what's happening in that market and be able to anticipate that and forecast that is phenomenal. It's powerful, right? Um, you know, and again, this, this idea of popularity and, and what I call general acceptance, we were able to go out and get a Best Western franchise for our existing Bayman Gardens community. 54 condos up, another 12 under construction, brand, you know, get the franchise and brand it as a product for the mainstream traveler. Look, if you're a niche traveler, you don't care. You'll stay in anything because you're just going fishing or you're just going diving, right? But the cruise ship passenger who came two, three years ago, you know, when they go back to Belize, they're probably looking for a brand name. Well, Best Western is affordable, uh, beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful affordability, $150, $125, $150 a night product off the water, a couple blocks, but beautiful amenities, swimming pool, clubhouse, tennis courts, all of the things that you're looking for when you get to a resort and the affordability. For people who want to own a residence, the first 54 are sold out, uh, but look at the price point. And we have the next building actually uh, under construction, the, uh, the 12 residences in the fleet building are also sold out. We're, we're, we're pre-selling the Galleon building right now, starting at $108,000. So for somebody who's either looking for a very affordable residence in a best Western community, which is nice, again, the standards are there, or as an investment, somebody says, I want this best Western studio condominium. Uh, I'm going to use it a few weeks a year. I'm going to let best Western rent it out the rest of the time. Easy. Uh, and, and, and that's what has attracted so many people to these products. Uh, we also have a licensing agreement with Marriott. Uh, we were able to get that in place about three years ago. Uh, we're in the final stages of getting it funded right now. Uh, again, the idea of a branded product. This is on the ocean. This is a much higher end product and uh, fits a different demographic. It, it, it's middle, it's upper middle class to upper class. That's the demographic this serves. But again, that demographic as Belize switches over to mainstream will be looking for branded product. Well, what's that mean to us? What's that mean to us as shareholders? Well, we're going to sell up to 40% of the residences, which is uh, a total of about 66. Uh, we plan to keep about 130 of these residences uh, for ourselves. So if you become an ECI shareholder, you're going to own a big chunk of this Marriott Hotel in Belize that we're developing. So again, we want that revenue. We want the cash flow. Uh, the cash flow projections are strong. Um, you know, we, we are very, very happy about what this Marriott will bring back to us in terms of cash flow. Uh, but again, it will also bring back a lot of sizzle. Uh, again, this idea of community, uh, just carrying it one step further. Community is not just you know, your neighbors, proximate neighbors, it's, it's all the people around you and, and, and being able to get our owners and our vacationers, right? Our renters love to come down and help launch baby turtles. I mean, we have a full house every time we, we do a turtle hatch, right? Uh, again, caring about the environment, doing beach cleanups, uh, working with gardening, building an agricultural element to create that sustainability and the resilience in the community, so important. But then again, just working in the local community, doing things that are meaningful to the greater neighborhood that we're in. 
So uh, bottom line is, is, is really this, you know, the best time to invest in a company is when they're expanding. And, and we are, we're, we're expanding rapidly. We've got uh, a couple more strategic acquisitions to make. One is a vineyard community because just not like not everybody wants to live at the beach. Uh, some people, you know, want to live in the highlands, the springtime all the time. Other people want a Napa Valley or Okanagan Valley uh, type of experience, right? If, you know, if you're in that, if you're in that 5%, right? Um, you know, run on up to Napa, Okanagan and get out your checkbook and write a, write a check for, you know, two, three, four million bucks and you can have a beautiful home in a vineyard. But if you've got 200, 300, $400,000, we can deliver that same lifestyle experience to the consumer marketplace for 10 cents on the dollar. So this is a strategic acquisition for us. Uh, likewise, Ecuador. Ecuador is very affordable. It's one of the most affordable countries in Latin America. And it, it provides that, that for, that, for that, what I would call the lower end of middle class, not lower middle class, but sort of when you get down to that, you know, that 50th percentile, 50th to 60th percentile, right? Those folks probably have social security anticipation, you know, contracts, it's a contract that, that they're going to receive, you know, 1,000, 1,200 bucks a month. Um, you can actually live pretty well in Ecuador on, on $1,000 to $1,200 a month. Uh, I'm not sure how you would live on that in any major U.S. city or, or most of the United States and have the quality of life that you would have in a place like Ecuador, where you could eat organic fruits every day. You could have a maid come to your house you know, a couple times a week and clean up. Um, you, you can really have this incredible quality of life that's so, so affordable. An acquisition that's, that's proximate, I'm, I'm actually headed to Mexico next week. Uh, to look at uh, another property. I've identified one property that will work for an acquisition there. I'll be looking at a second property uh, while I'm there and making some decisions. Uh, we have an affiliate uh, and, and we have an affiliate program. We have a group of people who uh, either have newsletters or blogs or vlogs uh, or, or realtors all across the United States and Canada who refer business to us. A huge affiliate uh, has over a half a million people that read his newsletters wants us to build a community in Mexico for his readers. Uh, and, and, and we've given him uh, you know, the upfront exclusive, right? So he can market it. If he fills it up, great. If he doesn't fill it up, then we'll market it uh, more broadly. I, I, I anticipate that with his audience and, and the people's loyalty to him uh, for, for what he's done for folks, he's in the crypto space. He's, he's helped a lot of people become very, very wealthy, recommending uh, crypto going back, you know, 10 years. Um, so anyway, so he's done a great job. He has a big following of people who, who are, are loyal to him and, and, and want, and, and he, he has heard this from them. Again, it's the listening to the marketplace. They want a community that they can call home. They want a community where they can talk crypto, uh, talk freedom, and, 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 and not be looked at as odd or strange. And, and they want a community that's agriculturally based, that has high levels of sustainability and resilience. Uh, and, and we can build that for him because this is what we do. We know how to do it. We do it very well. Uh, the, the subject property is uh, here in the Muscoto Valley. It is spectacular. Again, you can see it's agricultural. Uh, uh, there's some great places there. It is, it's in the country, but gosh, there's some great restaurants and, and really cool things to do around there. And it's only 90 minutes to the Port of Vallarta Airport. Uh, so anyway, stay tuned for that. that that's an acquisition that's that's uh, up and coming very, very soon. Uh, coming back to wrap up, you know what? We have a lot of competitive advantages in the marketplace. Uh, you know, the talent, the people, right? It's always about the people. Diversification is important. You know, if, if one country is doing great and another country is not, guess what? If you have many, if you have many countries in your portfolio, uh, you know, you, you do pretty well because very rarely would they all be down, so to speak. Uh, the demographics, my goodness, uh, you know, just serving the baby boomers, things were going pretty well. Uh, now serving uh, the digital nomads across many generations, uh, things are going uh, unbelievably well. And, uh, you know, and getting in ahead of a, uh, a planned IPO, very, very uh, nice opportunity for, for folks who are taking a look at this opportunity now. Again, we have a great team. Uh, and, 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 you know, we run our business like a business. Uh, we have a key man life insurance policy on myself and my business partner, Joel Nagel. Uh, if I get hit by a bus, the company gets two and a half million dollars, right? Uh, we've got great depth of talent. Many of our people have been with us a decade or more. And, and, and that's great. But if it's all up inside their head and they leave or, you know, whatever, then it's gone. 
uh, we, we've taken the last three years, uh, uh, our chief operating officer, uh, really, and we hired some outside consultants to come in and help us institutionalize the knowledge that's in people's heads, creating policies, procedures, and systems to get the job done. Uh, and, and again, this was one of the reasons we were able to quick turn on a dime. We saw the opportunity with the digital nomads. We shifted our marketing. We shifted our product. And all of a sudden, within a very short space of time, we could deliver tiny homes, construction documents, and, 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 and community design so that literally, uh, let me just think back, um, in less than six months, we were under construction with the first 20 tiny homes uh, turning on a dime. Again, ha having everything in place, everything ready to go uh, made that possible. Uh, the organization is, is, is deep and broad. Uh, we've got a great team of people. Uh, and again, all of this information, if you wanna look more granularly, uh, is in the business plan. Uh, just to sort of wrap up with one last big picture concept, uh, you know, th th this idea of being able to listen to a consumer, uh, critically important, right? To, to, we go to, we, we put ads in, in, uh, in magazines or, or just to give an example, uh, Rachel and I and a couple of our salespeople are off to Miami this week, uh, tomorrow, the next day uh, for a Bitcoin conference. We were invited to speak at a Bitcoin conference. Why? Because we're one of the few developers in the region outside of the U.S., maybe even in the U.S., I don't know. But outside the U.S., I know we're one of the few, if only, developers who actually will accept crypto for the ownership of a piece of property. And, you know, we're going to be in front of 15,000 people. We were invited to speak at this conference, and I think we're the only real estate company, right? I mean, wow. So we go to this conference, we have these beautiful pictures. And when somebody comes walking by, instead of trying to sell them Belize, like, oh, Belize is the best thing since sliced bread. Look at the diving, right? We don't have to sell people. We can actually just step back and go, which picture up here caught your eye? And they might say the diving. Oh, I love them. I love to dive or, or, or fly fish or whatever. And we say, well, that is Belize. I mean, it's phenomenal, beautiful, right? But somebody else might say, you know, I'm a golfer. I love to golf. And we say, well, that's Grand Pacifica, year-round golf, just like Southern California. Somebody else sees the vineyard and they say, oh, my goodness, that, that I've always wanted to do that, right? And so all of a sudden, instead of selling somebody what we have, we can serve them with what they want. Powerful differentiator in the marketplace. But wait, there's more. It gets better. It gets better. As the CEO of the company, my job is to run an efficient business to generate bottom line profits, right? So guess what? You know, if we were just Belize, we would still have many of the same people. We'd still have a, you know, a founder and a co-founder. We'd still have, you know, a chief operating officer. We'd have a sales team, a marketing team. We'd have an accounting group. We'd have engineers. We'd have architects. We'd have all this expensive overhead and we'd get to apply it to one project, one project. Think about that. All those costs layered on top of one project. Whereas with today, five projects in four countries, we can take all that same overhead and distribute it across today, five, ultimately six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 neighborhoods in, in seven or eight countries. Talk about efficiency. That's economy of scale. And then we have a choice. We have options, right? We can either put our product in the marketplace at whatever the current market price is and make more, right? Because if our costs are lower on any singular basis, we make more, or we can get our prices down a little bit, be the most competitive in the market, right? And still probably make more, right? And we're serving a consumer with what they want. In the end, it's always about the consumer, but it is also about running an efficient business that generates bottom line profits. Uh, you know, if you decide you want to invest in our company, all that's great. You know, great people, great talent, great systems, great procedures, great marketing, great stuff. But in the end of the day, what does it really matter, right? Ideas are kind of ephemeral, right? The thing that you want to own are hard assets. When you own ECI, you own a piece of five miles of beachfront real estate, 4,000 acres. You own this. This is a hard, it's not a thing, it's many things, right? But it is hard, tangible assets in four countries today. Uh, and you'll also own a piece of everything we do going forward. Uh, the balance sheet, the, uh, the numbers are strong. Uh, uh, please, if, you, uh, uh, if you're interested, we'll send you the NDA. 
uh, complete that. We'll send you back the, the financials, the business plan. You can look at all this in, in great detail. And we want you to, if you want to, if you want to own shares of the company, we want you to have all the information you need to make that decision. Uh, you know, one of the things people ask is, well, what happens if you don't take the company public? And you know what? It is a future event. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. Lots of things that we don't control impact whether we can take the company public or not. Um, you know, just today, using all the assets that we currently own, right? Just the assets that we already have in inventory and that we own, the profitability coming out of that uh, is about $150 per share. And that, by the way, is selling it for the average price we've already sold real estate for. We're not increasing. We're not saying there's nothing. No, no. Take the average price we've sold real estate for the last, you know, we've only been selling real estate for about uh, 19 of the, of, the, of the 24 years. But in the last 19 years, what's the average price that we've sold real estate or the average profitability on each address? That, that's really how we measure it. What is the profitability per address? Because you have homes, you have home sites, you have tiny homes, you have condos, like they're all different, right? But at the end of the day, each one of those is an address and each one generates a profit margin. The average profit on existing inventory generates about 150 bucks a share. And you know what? We have service businesses. We talked about them earlier, right? Reoccurring revenues, whether it's the Marriott generating cash flow back to the company, uh, our utility companies, we're the utilities, wherever we can be, the water company, the electric company, the TV and internet provider, we are, you are, if you're a shareholder, you are. Um, all of these revenue sources coming back to the company when the addresses are uh, sold out, again, it, it ramps up slowly because you have to sell the addresses. But when you have homeowners and, and property owners utilizing these services, uh, it produces a very, very nice return to our shareholder group as well. Uh, again, uh, incredible growth. Uh, you, you, you see these numbers. Uh, again, they're all spelled out in the financials, but uh, in the first four months of the year, uh, we have already exceeded all of 2020 uh, gross sales. So great time to be getting in. Uh, share price today is $17.60. Again, things are moving. We'd love to have you enjoy uh, being a shareholder. And uh, the minimum investment, by the way, you can see there in the bottom left is, is $80,960, call it $81,000. Uh, it's 4,600 shares. Uh, we will be raising the share price as we break ground on the Marriott, likely to happen uh, the middle of next month or this month. I'm sorry, we're in June. Middle of this month, the funding is coming through. Uh, we get the Mexico property sometime later in the year. Uh, share price will go up a couple bucks. Why? Because the company's worth more. If we have a married under construction, the company's worth more. We add, you know, 500 to 1,000 acres of property in Mexico, company's worth more. So as we add assets or add value to the company, the share price moves up. Uh, and so again, we'll need shareholders later too. But um, but if if getting in at 1760 makes sense, uh, you know, let's talk in the next week or two or three, and we'll get that figured out for you. Um, the, uh, uh, the only other thing I would say is the minimum investment is 4,600 shares. Uh, we do have some great property premiums that begin at 10,000 shares uh, as well. So uh, depending on what the investment level is that, that fits your specific circumstances, your portfolio sizing, uh, get back to us. Again, nice property premiums at 10,000 shares or above. Again, the, the, the Marriott uh, will be under construction here shortly. Uh, that will trigger a share price increase of a dollar. Um, so this would be something that, you know, again, if it makes sense, we'd love to hear from you sooner rather than later. And I think you'll be happy if you do that. If you're accredited, obviously you can own shares of the company. If you're not accredited, you know, you might want to own a, a residence, one of the, the, the best Western studios or a tiny home or, or even a Marriott property. So uh, keep those in mind. And I think uh, I, I almost done. I, we mentioned the crypto, we mentioned uh, financing, and we mentioned uh, self-directed IRA. So just just some ways that you can get involved if this is something that you want to do. All right, Rachel, um, we're, we're at the end here. I, I probably still went a little bit long and I apologize for that. Um, but, uh, but I'll stick around for, you know, as long as folks have questions. So. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Mike. That was a very informative presentation. So appreciate it. Um, you know, one of the questions that I'm seeing is here is when would the next share price increase be and how or why does a share price increase happen? Sure. Um, it, it, it 
you know, again, it's a future event. It, it may or may not happen, but we anticipate the uh, actual construction start on the Marriott sometime in June. Um, and so, you know, when we, when we get to work building the foundations of the Marriott, I mean, we've already invested uh, almost $5 million. I think it was $4.6 million the last I checked. Um, so we've invested $4.6 million into the Marriott thus far. Uh, but when we begin foundation work, uh, uh, that, that's visual in a way that hiring architects and paying engineers and all that kind of stuff isn't. Uh, so, uh, you know, th th that's sizzle. That, that changes the value of the company. A company that's actually under construction of a Marriott is worth more than a company that's not building a Marriott. Um, and so that's why the share price will go up. Um, there's more value to the company and, and for existing shareholders, um, you know, it's not fair to, to sell off our asset, the company, uh, for the same price if it's worth more. That, that's just not fair to the existing shareholders. So uh, we look at that as a board and as a management committee. And, and we, you know, we, we, we take a look at what the value is that's being added. And we, and, and we add that then back to the share price uh, to, 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 to what I would say, keep it, keep it fairly level uh, for the new value to, the, to whatever that new share price is. All right, thank you. Next question is, can you confirm what an accredited investor is again? Uh, yeah, the, the definition is in the form. Uh, it's a little more lengthy than what I'm gonna say, but basically if you have $1 million of liquid uh, assets, I say liquid, but you know, assets excluding your primary residence, right? So if, you, if you're worth a million dollars or more excluding your primary residence or your single earner and you earn 200,000 or a couple earning 300,000, then you do qualify as an accredited investor. The, the form that we can send to you uh, uh, that also is in a non-disclosure agreement um, has the definition. You'll have to acknowledge that you are, if you are, um, and then we'll be able to send you the business plan, the financials, uh, and you'll be able to take a, a much deeper dive uh, into the company. Okay, great. And someone here is asking about dividends. Can you talk a little bit more about dividends and what the projected um, payout schedule looks like over time? Sure. You know, we, uh, we, we actually did pay cash dividends from 2004 through 2009. Uh, in 2009, you know, the, the, the real estate world was falling apart in the U.S. and, and it was falling apart likewise in, in Belize and Nicaragua and Costa Rica as well. Um, and so we, we suspended cash dividends. We went to a dividend reinvestment program, uh, which is being calculated. Uh, so those, those shares that, that would have uh, you know, been earned you know, as a dividend are now being paid. You know, I'm sorry, the, the, the money that would have been paid as a cash dividend are accruing to shareholders as a, uh, an extra share uh, increment to their, to their holdings. Um, you know, we've, we've toyed around with a dividend. In fact, it was one of the questions that came up on our shareholder meeting today uh, from some of our shareholders asking about dividends. Um, you know, we, we really have a choice as a company. You know, we, we, we are growing, we are expanding. We're going to be, you know, we're going to be adding some more investment to our Marriott property. Uh, we'll be acquiring some assets in Mexico. Then we'll have to spend some money to develop those assets. Uh, and I say some money, we're, we're, we're talking several million dollars. And so, you know, we have a choice as, as the uh, management and leadership of the company, we can, we can use our own internal money, right? So if we, if we generate an extra $3 million of cash flow, we can, we can plow that into, you know, Marriott investment, right? Or we could pay that out as a dividend and sell more shares, right? And so round numbers, that'd be like, what, 150, 200,000 shares or something. And, and, and so, you know, we look at that and we, we think to ourselves, you know, if, if we're going to be in business for the long term, and I know people kind of snicker, I've, I've, I've heard it, but anyway, you know, if we're going to be in business 100 years, and, and I do believe that our company will be in business 100 years, uh, you know, it, it, it's a little bit short-sighted to pay a dividend today and sell more shares because then you're diluting the current shareholder base. Uh, it, it, it certainly pays out something in the immediate term, but long term, uh, it, it's worse for the shareholders. Um, and if we are successful in taking the company public, any and all dilution actually uh, uh, has a much greater impact by whatever the multiple is uh, that, that you know, we, we hope to achieve in an IPO, 
right? So, so it's magnified significantly. So from, from our perspective as a, as a company and as the leadership of the company, uh, we, we look at this and we say, you know what, for the next year or two, it probably makes no sense to pay a cash dividend because we can take whatever cash that we would have paid in a dividend, plow it back into, say, you know, the money for the Marriott that we need or, or the acquisition in Mexico or the development of the property in Mexico, whatever it is, in lieu of selling more shares to raise that cash, because ultimately we will be far better off. All shareholders will be far better off uh, if we use our own internal uh, uh, cash than, than selling more shares and diluting. So anyway, let me, while I'm on the point of dilution, uh, it, it, it is finite. We, we've authorized up to 10 million and two shares, you know, 10 million shares, uh, but 10 million and two technically legally. Uh, and we've issued about 7.3, maybe seven, just under 7.4. Uh, at the end of last year, it was 7,340,000. We've, we've, we've issued some more shares this year. Um, so there is a finite cap on the amount of dilution uh, that the company can have. It's 10 million shares, and we're, you know, we're a little over two and a half million shares away. Um, you know, so this round of funding for a million shares uh, is to raise up to about $17.6 million, uh, assuming that we raise it all at 1760. Uh, which isn't going to happen. The share price is going to go up. So, you know, we can sell less shares and raise the same amount of money, but it's for a very specific purpose. It is for the, uh, the investment, the equity piece of the Marriott. It's for the acquisition of a property and development of that property in Mexico. And it's for the acquisition of an asset in Argentina uh, and even possibly Ecuador. Uh, maybe not development of those assets, that could happen later, uh, but the acquisition of those assets in the next 18 to 24 months. So that's the purpose we're raising money. That's why we're on the call this evening. Uh, you know, if we don't need cash to expand our business and grow our business, uh, we don't raise money because there's zero reason I want to sell a share. I want to sell the least possible shares because my shares are common stock, the same as yours. Uh, and the more shares we sell, the less I make right? The less our current shareholders make, and I'm current shareholder. So, you know, I'm a good capitalist. I want to make more, not less. So the least number of shares sold means I make the most. And all of our shareholders together, because we all own the same shares, we all make more. So dividend's a great question. It's certainly tied into a lot of other, you know, elements, right? It's a lot of strings pulling on that. Um, but uh, anyway, that, that, that's really where we are. I, I, I'm guessing that we might pay some kind of symbolic dividend, uh, uh, probably not this year, maybe next year. Um, but, but again, really plowing most of the money uh, back into the business so we don't have to sell more shares, so we don't have to dilute, uh, so that you know, when we get these acquisitions in place, uh, e, A, if we, uh, if we do go public, we get the multiple on that. Or B, if we don't, for whatever reason, go public, uh, you know, we, we then have these assets uh, in-house, uh, we develop them, we sell them, and we start paying a huge dividend stream for the long term. Because if, you know, look, again, it, lots of reasons an IPO won't work, right? I mean, the markets are down. Uh, there's just, you know, lots of things, right? I mean, it could, real estate could go out of favor. I mean, there's just a lot of reasons why it might not happen. Again, we're doing everything we're supposed to do to make it as likely to happen as possible. Um, but if it doesn't happen, the dividends uh, will be the cash flow mechanism uh, for shareholders. And I expect them to be very significant. Uh, uh, just based on current numbers, they would be very, very significant dividends. All right, fantastic. And so Daryl here is asking, buying a property at Best Western or Marriott, would I be able to reside year round or is it seasonal? And I can answer that one. So you have the choice if you want to live in your condo full time or if you want to put it into the respective um, pro, um, um, respective rental management program. So if you do want to live in it, you are able to. If you want to put it in the Best Western or the Marriott rental program, you're able to. You can't necessarily keep flip flopping back and forth every year. Uh, when, when you decide to become an owner, you can let us know if you want to be um, owning it from the investment perspective or the lifestyle. So you would just let us know there, Daryl, and let us know what your interest is so we can send you the information if you don't have it already. All right, the next question is also from Daryl, and he's saying, what or how do I connect with a POC or point of contact to take next steps to buy shares? 
Great question. So uh, feel free to reach out to us. You see Mike's email address there, info at ecidevelopment.com. We will make sure you have the subscription agreement. Once you complete the subscription agreement, you email a copy back to us, you mail a copy down to Belize. And then from there, uh, we will send you the information for payments. It'll go to a Florida bank account. And, uh, and then once funds are received, you'll receive a receipt and you'll also receive a share certificate. So pretty straightforward. It could uh, be as easy as quick and quick as you want it to be, but you are able to use or to own the, the shares in your personal name, a self-directed IRA that's been popular for U.S. citizens. You can use your custodial account. Um, in addition to that, in a foreign LLC or Belize IBC, however it is you choose to own it. Trust has been a big one for estate planning. So you have that, uh, that choice there. And, and Daryl, you'll also receive 10% off of, of any uh, purchase of an ECI property. So 10% off of Best Western, 10% off of Marriott. Um, and then if your investment is 10,000 shares or more, the property credits uh, come into play. So just let me run an example. Uh, let's assume it's a Best Western studio for 100, 108, but let's call it 100 because that's easy math for me. Um, you would uh, you'd, you'd, uh, take a 10% discount. So that would take it to 90 then you would apply a $40,000 property credit, which would take it to 50. So really in that particular case, you would own your best Western studio for, for basically half price. Uh, if it was a Marriott residence there, they start around 300. So again, you'd take 30 off for your 10% and then you would take another 40 off for your property credit. So you'd have end up with about a $70,000 uh, discount. The property credit is good one time. It's a single use property credit. Um, uh, the 10% discount is forever. So uh, again, that, 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 that's an advantage depending on the level of investment that would make sense for you. Uh, and, and again, if you reach out to us, uh, you know, you'll get Rachel, you'll get me, uh, we'll, we'll circulate a couple emails if we want to get on the phone specifically and talk about a case, uh, we can walk through those numbers and, and look at them with you and, and see what makes the most sense. All right, fantastic. And, you know, Greg, you asked some really great questions here, and I know we answered a few of them throughout um, the Q&A, but I just wanted to address this one that you had at the end is, do you anticipate this IPO will be set up as a REIT? No, I, I do not. Again, uh, we're, we're, we're going to hire, uh, you know, the, the, the right professionals, right? The broker dealers, the lawyers that are securities lawyers. Um, and as we wade into this, you know, we're going to be open again. We're going to listen. We're, we're hiring. You go to a doctor, you, you, you listen to the council, right? You pay money and you're supposed to listen. So, you know, I, I could, I, I find it hard to imagine that that would be what, you know, somebody would, would recommend. But if we, if we hire, you know, the, again, you know, the, the broker dealers and the lawyers and, and they say, look, for these 73 reasons, you really want to be a REIT. Um, okay. I mean, I, I, I'm not against it. I just don't know that we're really quite what a REIT is in the sense that you know we're more of a developer as opposed to a property manager. Uh, the cash flow is is not as predictable, right? I think REITs like fairly consistent cash flow, and you can run models. You get a big enough you know sampling of of residents and and renters. You you kind of forecast that out and and get you know decent you know whatever steady cash flow. Uh, in the developed business, it's it's definitely not like that. Um, it's a lot harder to predict. So again, I can't see how we would be a REIT, but I wouldn't necessarily be against it if that was the professional recommendation uh, from the uh, from the lawyers and, and the broker dealers. I don't know. All right, great. And we started to allude to this before, but Mike, why don't you just confirm um, how would I sell my shares, ECI shares pre-IPO? Um, great question. Uh, you, you can't. Um, this is what's in the paperwork. It's very specific. Uh, in the business plan, also on the subscription agreement, uh, because you know we're going to take your money. If you invest, we're going to take your money and we're going to buy a piece of property in Mexico with it, for example. Or, or if we already own the property in Mexico, we're going to build a road on the property in Mexico. And so that money is committed. It's gone. It, it's in the ground. And so there, there is no liquidity uh, uh, other than A, an IPO, if that were to happen, or B, uh, uh, an exchange, which could also be uh, what I would call a, uh, a non-primary IPO. So for example, a, a major exchange is going to give us lots of liquidity. It's going to give us you know, the access to capital, which is why we want to go public. Let me be very clear. The reason we want to take the company public isn't you know, Mike's big payday, Mike's big cash out. 
Uh, I fully intend to keep the vast majority of my stock forever. Um, you know, I hold a lot of it in a trust for my family. Um, I want them to, to receive the dividends for, you know, for years to come. And, 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 and coming back to the dividend question, you know, once the company's public, uh, the dividend flow will be on full speed ahead. Uh, because at that point, we're developing real estate. We're, you know, we, we've got the ability to grow the company in other ways. Uh, the profitability of the company will be distributed uh, as dividends. So the dividend stream is, is really uh, uh, one way or the other, either you know, after an IPO or in place of an IPO if we're not successful. Um, uh, but a major exchange gives us the ability to raise a lot of money for the company. That, that's, that's the reason we as a management team and an executive management team and a board want to take the company public. Uh, sure, it's a big payday for shareholders who want to sell their shares. And, and, and that's great. I mean, if, if, you, if you can and you can get a multiple, great, sell them, right? Um, but that's not why we're doing it as a company. We're, we're, we want to take the company public because we'll have access to inexpensive capital, right? And, and we, can, we can look to financial institutions, big insurance companies, uh, to be able to get debt at a reasonable price. And we don't like that particularly, but, but there's a good, there is good debt out there. Um, or, or we put uh, treasury stock into the, into the marketplace and we raise a lot of money to come back and, and build out the marina, for example, in, in Costa Rica or, or develop out the new property in Ecuador, right? So access to capital is a big, big reason. Uh, it certainly is a liquidity event for uh, shareholders. Uh, but there are also minor exchanges, Bermuda, Panama, uh, which would do part of the equation, which is provide liquidity for shareholders. Uh, it probably wouldn't help the company raise big money or get access to institutional capital. Um, so, so one of the things that we've looked at, again, we understand liquidity. We understand that people want the ability to exit their shares. Uh, you know, again, we're, we're striving for the, for the major exchange that would let us accomplish a lot of corporate goals. Uh, a secondary exchange would be a way to uh, give liquidity to the shareholders um, without sort of the, the other benefits of being a public company that would accrue uh, to the company, not to the individual shareholders. So uh, there are a few different levers we can push, but coming back to answer your question, until the company is public, uh, the shares are illiquid. Uh, again, it's, it's very well noted in the business plan and also in the subscription agreement, but it's a great question, and I thank you for asking it. Uh, if you decide to invest in ECI, uh, invest only the amount of money that you can lock up for, for you know, the foreseeable future, because again, um, it, it is illiquid until uh, uh, an IPO or similar uh, liquidity event you know, that would free those shares up. All right, and then Greg is asking just please touch again on the timing of the IPO and best worst case scenario of what can happen in that planned time frame. You know, best case scenario, 2023, 2024, uh, you know, opening the Marriott would be uh, a lot of sizzle uh, that, that again, it, it'll produce some cash flow, two and a half, three million dollars, which not sneezing at that number, but, but, but you know, it, it, it's not going to be a barn burner in terms of profitability for the company. However, you know, it's sort of like the fajitas, you know, at the, at the restaurant, right? I mean, nobody eats the sizzle, right? You eat the steak, the potatoes, or the steak, the onions, and the peppers, right? That's what you eat, right? But it's the sizzle that, get everybody, that gets everybody's head turning. The Marriott's a lot of sizzle, right? It's a lot of sizzle. And so 2023, 2024, uh, coinciding with the opening of the Marriott would be the ideal target uh, IPO date. Um, w w I mean, worst case scenario, it never happens, right? It, it never happens, right? That's the worst case scenario. Um, you know, we, uh, we develop real estate, we sell real estate, we pay dividends. Uh, people are locked into the shares they own, um, you know, and the dividend flow um, is the exit strategy. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, as we look at the forecast, we look at the profitability, we look at our models, uh, it's not really a stretch to say that, you know, just from the sale of properties, that we're going to kick off two, three, maybe four bucks a share um, within a couple of years. By 2023, 2024, we really will have the profitability in place to kick off that kind of, of dividend, two, three, four bucks. Um, uh, that being the case, I mean, if, if you bought in, you know, in 1760 and, you know, whatever the, 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 you know, the dividend was three bucks, 
what's that, five years, right? So, I mean, again, uh, worst case scenario, it, it's a dividend payout. You own the shares and, and that's what happens. So, um, you, know, you know, nobody likes to think about the worst case scenario, but, but I do actually, I, I, like to, I like to look at it. I like to think about it. I like to discuss it. And, uh, and I appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you. All right, perfect. And I know we're just a little bit over the hour here. We need to get started a little late. So we'll just answer this one last question. And then uh, from there, folks, you'll receive a copy of this recording. You'll receive also the NDA if you did not yet complete that so that you can receive the business plan and the other information that you would like to see about us. And all right, so in the meantime, Mike, let's uh, end it here with who is this investment right for? Who's this investment right? Good question. You know, by the way, I don't think we've ever had this question before. Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, huh. All right, it, it's right for an adventurous soul. <laughs> let me let me start there. You you better be an adventurous soul. Um, you know, I, I think it's right for somebody who who has, you know, let, let me just throw some numbers out. I'm not an investment advisor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a tax advisor. Blah blah blah. All that kind of stuff, right? But but if you know if 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 a hundred thousand dollars is a, a pretty small percent of your investable portfolio. And you say to yourself, you know what, I, I can I can put a hundred thousand dollars at risk. Um, I, I I look, you could lose it all. I I I'm you know right. We have to be very clear about that. You could lose it all, but I mean you know ECI owns five miles of beachfront real estate and four thousand acres of property. It'd be hard to lose it all. I can tell you, we'd have to try real hard to lose all of that, right? But anything's possible. Um, so assuming we're not trying to lose it, I, I think you know, you've know you got a fairly substantial asset base that backs up that investment. The question really you have to think about is, you know, can I wait for liquidity in the form of an IPO uh, you know, in say three years, four years, and, and, and hopefully in many times multiple, that's the goal, right? Um, or and or uh, can I hold on to this stock and collect a dividend for the next you know, 10, 15, 20 years uh, that would pay out very, very handsomely. But, you know, again, you know, $3 on 17s, I don't know, what about a 16%, 17% return, something like that. That's not bad. I mean, like, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd invest in something to get a 16, 17% return. Um, but, but again, it could be a 2% return. It could be a no percent return, right? So I think the investment has to be for somebody who's adventurous, who's looking for hard assets overseas, Right. But not just hard assets overseas, a company with a track record like us, right? So we have a track record, but, but a company that takes that hard asset and is able to do something with it to create value and cash from it. And we've demonstrated that. Again, no predictor of the future, right? But we've demonstrated that we know how to take a hard asset and convert it into something that a consumer wants to own and they're willing to pay us money to get it and we make a profit doing that, right? And so I think the right, the right person is someone who's looking for investment diversification, geographic diversification, um, and, uh, and, 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 and is adventurous to some degree because you know what, if you walk down you know, general suburbia across America and you talk about this investment, you know, 99% of the people are gonna roll their eyes and go, you gotta be kidding me, what? Um, but you know, a, a, a good friend of mine is Steve Sugarroot, and 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 Steve says if you if you're going to make great investments, you know, you don't get out on the beach. Now, he uses the guys out on the beach every day. You know, 50 of them, you know, trolling over the sand with their metal detectors. Right in Florida, he lives in San Fernando Beach. But anyway, um, he says, yeah, I see those guys out there, and I think, well, like, how much money can you actually make? Everyone's looking at the same sand. Um, you know, you got to look under different rocks. You got to find different sand and. Uh, we are certainly different sand. Uh, I think that we're, we're a proven entity. Uh, again, the business plan spells that out in great, great detail. Um, but the investment's right for somebody who uh, can put, you know, whatever that amount of money is at risk for the medium to long term and, uh, you know, and, and, and be, uh, you know, be comfortable with that. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you for that, Mike. I think that was a, a great response. And I'm just going through, it looks like we got through all of the questions. So very comprehensive presentation, a lot of information shared. 
Uh, as I mentioned, we will be sending out the recording and sending out the NDA after this. So you can have access to the business plan if you haven't yet received that. But thank you everybody so much for joining. I, uh, I really appreciate you joining us today, learning more about your international opportunities. And Mike, any final words from your end? Yeah, no, I, I'm worn out. I mean, you know, six hours of shareholder meeting and this, this is definitely uh, stick a fork in me. I am done. Uh, I'm going to go eat uh, dinner with my family now. And uh, Rachel, thank you for putting this all together. I, I, as always, I appreciate you know, all your hard work to, to pull these things together and make it happen. Uh, please uh, reach out to us. Uh, we, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to talk about your specific circumstances and how an investment in ECI might be a good fit. So again, thank you, everybody. Good night. And thank you, Rachel. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.